welcome to CC Midweek. I want to just do a little bit of a shout out. So Anthony signed on to be an intern. So he was an intern for us and he's going to be going away to college in August. But I just, I've been watching him. I know, boo. I was like, can you go to college and just like commute? <laughs> um, but I have seen God work in his life in the kind of way that just excites me and the kind of way that makes me think, man, when you step up to trusting God, what can't he do? And now this beautiful girl who didn't even come here a year ago, she got baptized, she's found God, and she's going to be a new intern for us next year. Yeah. I want to invite any college-age student. Taylor, can you stand up for a second, baby? I'm sorry, she hates me right now. Taylor is going to be getting all the college-age kids together right after church just to hang for a few minutes, just to meet each other, because I want you to know that there's a space for you, that this church needs you, that this is a place where you can grow, you can thrive, and where God is calling you to do awesome things. I love you. We love you, too. Okay, bye, babes. Holy, I am worked up. John 16, 32, 33. Behold, the hour is coming indeed, it has come, when you will be scattered each to his own home and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. Listen, in the world you're going to have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray tonight that your peace that passes all understanding will fill the hearts and the minds and the souls of every man, and man, woman, child, person listening, wherever they are, Father. I pray that you just fill them with who you are. I pray where the world wants to just rob us of peace, Father, that you will give us a new insight, that we will make a bigger picture of who you are, that we will see the eternal God who is at work and that you will fill us with the best. In your mighty son's name we pray, amen. I've been thinking a lot about joy, and I heard someone say that joy is connected to our peace, because it's hard to have joy when you don't have peace with God, when you don't have peace with others, when you don't have peace with yourself. It's hard to have a sense of joy. And I was thinking about peace in my life and how there are so many times in my life where I feel like I'm chasing it. I feel like uh, there are obstacles that keep getting in the way of feeling peace. There are things that happen in life that we literally have no control over. And there are things that are put in our lap that we, we would never want to be put in our lap. Um, my dad and I, we do a podcast. We release it at the end of every month. And we're going to go a little bit deeper into this peace mindset we're going to release it next week, so I highly recommend, if you haven't checked it out, go check it out, because he's got some great insight. It's called Grow Tential, and you can find it wherever you find podcasts, and it's also on Church's website and app. But I feel like when I think about peace, there was a time in my life where I was, like, all these things were put on my lap that I didn't ask for. And I went to a counselor, and I was like, help me please, <laughs> because I feel like there's a storm that's raging all around, and the waves are knocking me left and right, but I want to be solid in the waves. I want to be solid when the storm comes, because I have three kids and a husband that I love and a church that I love, and I just want to be solid in the storm. And what I realized was the number one way to get peace is always going to be determined by our view of God. My peace will be affected and shaped by how big my God is. You see, I think for some of us, there is this idea that um, uh, I learned about God my whole life. So when I was a kid, we would have like the flannel graphs. Anyone remember flannel graphs? You college kids are like, I don't even know what the heck that is. But it was like it was like a little 2D Jesus, and you'd put it on this felt board, and you'd pop it up, and Jesus would stick on the wall, and you'd be like, that's so cool. And that was like our cool thing for church, you know. And I learned about God, but it was like this storybook God. It never really took um, root in my heart. 
it was like I knew he was real, I knew he was there, but it really didn't touch my life outside of my dad being a minister, and we would pray, and like I knew God was good, but I didn't have that personal relationship with him. It was this 2D Jesus. It was, my relationship was flat. There was nothing of who God was touching me, affecting my everyday life. And I think for some of us, we have a 2D Jesus, Some of us have this storybook image of who God is, and it's nothing that is, like, really fully affecting us. But the problem is when relationships fall apart, a 2D Jesus doesn't work. When finances are, you're having a hard time knowing or thinking how you're even going to pay the next bill, a storybook Jesus isn't really going to cover your need. When divorce comes or relationships break up, there's, you're going to need more then a small, flat view of Jesus. For others of us, there's this idea, I heard this story, actually watched it, I wish I could show you because it's so good, Um, but YouTube will kick us down, so I have to tell you and show a picture. Um, But the idea is there was an Olympic runner who ran the 400-meter race, and he was in the semifinals to make it to the Olympics. He beat everybody in all the trials like he beat them by a long shot so he was really planning on winning the gold medal and what happened is when he ran that first 200 meters something happened he felt a pop and it took him out and he thought okay I'm gonna I'm gonna get up I think I can still catch him and he tried to run but he couldn't run and I think for some of us what we feel like is that pulled hamstring that he had, I think it was actually a torn hamstring that caused the stop, that caused the pain, that's how we see Jesus. That's how we view God. That there has been a pain in our life that has taken us out. It's stopped us from accomplishing what we've really wanted in life. There's been things that have hurt us, and so we view Jesus as this torn muscle, and he is the one who inflicts pain instead of the one who is with you. This racer, he was all alone on the field. The race had finished. He, he was like, I'm not going to just not finish the race. I have to at least finish the race. And this becomes one of the most popular scenes because he gets up and his dad breaks through, man. He breaks through. He runs on the field or the track. And everybody, there's like officials you can't see. I couldn't find pictures of it, but in the video you can look it up on YouTube the officials were coming and trying to pull the dad away, like, off of him, like, if you help, it won't count kind of thing. And the dad is, like, pushing them and pushing them. And he takes his son, and he puts him in his arms, his arm around it, and he's just comforting him all the way to the finish line. He literally is saying to him, you have nothing to prove. You can stop. You have nothing to prove, but I got you. I got you. And he walks him through the finish line. For some of you, that's who you think of as God. He's a good father who's got your arms, who's got you coming through that saying, listen, you have nothing to prove. You're good. I love you. I know you. You are mine. And we're going to be in it together. Whatever your view is of who God is, it's going to directly affect how you get peace in your life. It's going to directly affect how you face life, what you take on, what you don't take on, what you think of yourself, what you don't think of yourself, what you try, what you don't try, who you love, who you don't love. It's just going to affect everything. And I think most of us know that there is a truth in that there is a God who does love us, but there are times in our life where we don't want to have to go through the pain of life. Every single one of us knows pain. Every single one of us knows hardship. Every single one of us has something that we've gone through in life. And oftentimes I'll find myself like praying like, God, just take it. Take it. Take it from me, please. Because the truth is, I really just want God to deliver me from it. But when I look at scripture time and time and time again, he, that's not what he does. And a big part of me wants to ask, why? Like, why don't you do it? But the best question to ask yourself is, what's the purpose in it? See, God might not deliver us from it, but I promise you, he will always deliver you through it. 
in the book of Daniel, there is a young man named Daniel. And he is, uh, in the very first scene of this book, you see him, he is in Jerusalem, and the Babylonian king comes in, takes a bunch of stuff, and kind of takes people, like whoever he wants, the best looking, the wealthiest, um, he takes guys so that he can come train them for a couple years, and then they could work for them, for the Babylonians. And Daniel is taken. And I don't want this to be a storybook. I want us to feel this story, okay? Because sometimes we can hear these stories, or we've heard them before, or maybe it's the first time, and we have a small view of it. But this, this teenage boy was taken out of his home ripped out of his life and taken to a whole different place. He was taken and it was different food, it was a different culture, he had to be trained, he was in this with the king, and it's his whole world as he knows it is flipped upside down. The king trains him, and there's several kings now, and it's way later in Daniel's life. And Daniel has had this history with God now. Do you know he was almost 80 years old in chapter 6? And in chapter 6, we hear the story of Daniel and the lion's den. And he's an old man who has followed God faithfully. He spent his whole life in captivity. And, and God has worked in through his life over and over and over again. And now he's here in this moment, and there's a bunch of people underneath him. Like, God has this special favor on him, and he's overseeing a ton of officials, almost the second in command. And there's a moment where the people that are right underneath him, the governors, generals, that kind of thing, they want to set him up. And they look for things to try to set him up with. I said, Taylor, is Finsta still a thing, the fake Instagram? Evidently, you would make, like, a fake account on Instagram so you could kind of stalk and poke around other people. Okay, so this was like, they were, they were making a finsta. They were trying to find anything they could do. She said, no, by the way, it's not a thing anymore. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> they were trying to do and look at everything they could find to just take Daniel out. But the Bible tells us they couldn't find anything. There is nothing fake about him. There is nothing uh, that they could find that would take him from the position he was in. And so they came up with a plan. And something was put in Daniel's lap that he never expected. And the king makes this decree that basically says, you're not allowed to worship anybody else, seek anybody else, anything for the next 30 days. Mm, but this is why I love Daniel. In Daniel chapter 10, I, I saw this for the first time when I was studying this. I decided to use my phone today because it's bigger. I can see it. Daniel chapter 10. Should have stuck with the real thing. <laughs> it says, I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 6. Verse 10. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. When Daniel knew the document had been signed, he went up and he prayed three times like he had done previously. Oh, I love this, guys. I love it because he did not let the chaos of the world dictate his heart. He let the beauty and the strength and the faith of who God was dictate his circumstances. And Daniel has this lifetime of trusting God. He has this lifetime of seeing God work over and over and over and over again. And in the chaos, in the the entrapment in the pain Daniel says oh I know what I'm going to do I am going to seek my heavenly father just as I always have done his view of God was not small his view of God was so much bigger 
And because his view of God was big, he knew that whatever came his way, that God was faithful in somehow, some way, and maybe even if not, that God would see him through. He chose to let the beauty of who God was in his heart dictate the circumstance. How often do we get that crooked? How often does the pain of this world or the confusion or the chaos or work or whatever shouldn't dictate what's going on in your heart? And man, I want to get a bigger view of who God is. I have this woman who I listen to on repeat, and I want you all to listen to it. I'm going to attempt it, but she, it's called, uh, she's called Priscilla Shire, and she's called, it's called Who's Your Daddy? And she has this clip of her just saying all the things about God. And it's just to remind yourself that there are going to be moments in your life when you don't know what to do. There are going to be moments in your life that feel like there's a choice to be made. There's going to be moments in your life where it's like, are you in or are you out? And Daniel chose to be in. And in those moments, what I want for you is I want you to believe in a God who is so much bigger than a 2D storybook. And a God who is so much bigger than the, the cramp or the torn muscle. A God who is even bigger than just one that carries you through. I want you to hear and know who God is. And this, this is just a reminder of who our God is. There is but one true God, and his name is above all names. He's infinite in being. He always was, always is, and always will be. He is unchanged, unmuted. He is not ever going to do anything that is against you, but is always for you. He's the creator of everything, including your very soul. He knows you better and more than anybody else in this whole world. He was uh, bruised, but brought healing. He was pierced, but eased pain. He was persecuted, but brought freedom. He was dead, but brings life. He reigns to bring, bring peace because he is the prince of peace. He is light, he is love, and he is the Lord our God. He is our hope, he is our joy, and he brings life, and he brings it abundantly. I follow him because he is the wisdom of the wise. He will never leave you, forget you, or forsake you. Your God, he'll never overlook you. He's gritty, he's strength, he's awesome. He is a miracle-working, way-making God, and he is too good to not believe. Amen? You see, all these come from Scripture. All these sayings come from Scripture. It's who God is. And time and time again, I find myself putting him in a box. I find myself shrinking him. And I want to I wanna pull back and say, you are the God of the universe. And I want you to be so true in my heart and mind that I will choose to obey you. I will choose to follow you, even when it doesn't make sense. Even when I don't get it. Daniel prayed. The guys saw him. They ratted him out to the king. And Daniel was going to be put in the lion's den. I heard someone talking about this, like how terrible this would have been. And this is something the Medes and the Persians would have done. It was like kind of just what they did. If a decree was broken or if someone looked like they were uh, doing something against the king... They would take you and your whole family and they'd throw you in the lion's den. So Daniel's going in the lion's den and I wondered what peace he had the night before. Like I wonder what peace he had. Was there a sense of well-being? Is there a sense of an 80-year-old man? For some reason when I've read this story my whole life I thought he was young. I thought he was like 20. And here he is, an 80-year-old man, and I just wonder. He also has friends that have been here before, and God showed up in an incredible way and protected them. So I wonder if those stories were playing through his head. And the king is upset because he really likes Daniel, but there's nothing he can do because once that law is signed, there's nothing you can do. They throw Daniel in the den. And the next morning, they go in, and the king says, Daniel, has your God protected you? 
And Daniel says, my God has. I think about the, the lions in our life. I think about the, the lion of insecurity that's coming for us, man. The lion that want to rob my thought, my heart, my mind of who God created me to be. Do you know for years I would like I would never even think about preaching. I think I preached my first sermon at 23 and then my next one maybe 15 years later. Because I heard talk. I heard talk that I only have the position I have because I'm a Collings. I heard talk of uh, it's only because you're Doc's daughter. And that got into my head. And I thought, I don't want to turn people away from Christ, so I'm going to step back. I'm good. I don't need it. I don't want it. <laughs> Can I be honest? Don't want it. Is that too honest? But God kept tugging, and he kept calling, and he kept pulling, and someone one day said, enough. Are you going to let those voices be louder than the calling of God in your heart? And I said, no. And then he said, then do it. Go. And I planned a rise. It was a night for women, and I was so nervous, and I was so scared, and it was a night that I stepped into the first time, truly, after 15 years, just stepped into God's calling for my life. And God met me there. But the insecurity, that lion, man, did it come for me? It almost robbed me of more than a decade of maybe what God would have, I don't know where I would have been. And I don't want that lion for you. I read John because listen what it says. It says, there will be tribulation. There are going to be things. There's going to be things said. There's going to be things that are done. But God says, take heart. I have overcome the world. You got a lion of insecurity? Your heavenly father says, let me close the mouth of that lion. Let me hear you. Let me let you hear me say that you are chosen. You are loved and you are valued. And no one will take that away from you because you are mine. I want you to hear that voice of your heavenly father. If you're in a relationship and you're hurting and you're just trying to figure out what is the plan in all this, what is the purpose in all this, and you're trying to figure out the pain and you're just seeking peace, maybe you're lonely. You're just lonely. Maybe it's not that there's not someone next to you, it's just you're lonely with the person who is next to you. Your Heavenly Father says, I'm telling you all of this because people left me and I was alone, but I wasn't alone. The Father was with me. And when the lion of loneliness and hurt and relationship pain comes, I want you to know your Heavenly Father has come to close the mouth of that lion. He's looking at you and he's saying, I have something so much greater for you. You are never truly alone. I love you. I am your God. I am your savior. I am your safe place. I am your rock. And the mouth of the lion is closed. I saw years ago this illustration. This rope is supposed to represent eternity. I said, Brad, what's so hard about getting me a rope that represents infinity? Let's just make it happen. <laughs> okay, so this rope represents infinity. It represents the eternity of God. And in our life, I think so often we're, we're focused on this section this red section, do you know what this is? This is our one life on earth in the grand scheme of things. In the grand scheme of eternity, we have this small little piece that represents our one life. And so often I'm focusing on this. So often I'm focusing on all the things that are happening here. And I'm forgetting about the eternity that I have to come. I want us to grow the picture of who God is because he loves you. And there is a lifetime that you will be with him. There is a lifetime where you will get to know him. You'll walk side by side with him. And I don't know what it looks like. But man, all I know is that the Bible said there is uh, even, ugh, I can't remember the verse because I'm terrible at words. No eye has seen, no ear has heard how great it is for those who, for those of those, something about him loving you. 
It's a really good verse, guys. I'll find it later. And all I know is that God has something beautiful and big and powerful, and I don't find my peace when I'm focused on all these moments here. I find my peace when I think of a God of eternity, when I think of a God who knows the beginning from the end, when I think of a God that I can trust, and instead of asking why, I say, what is the purpose through it? I want us to put our eyes on eternity because your God is too big to shove in a small box. He's too big to think small. He's too big and life is too great for us to keep wasting so much energy on this. Your God is for you. He loves you. And he is a God of peace. Real peace will only ever be found in him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you. I pray that there is something inside of us that wants to know you more. I pray, Father, that there is something inside of us that we long just to hear your voice, to hear and know you, that we do want you to be a bigger God. I pray that people will just start inviting you in right here, right now. They'll invite you into their life. They'll invite you to their decisions. They'll invite you to be a part so that they can be connected to you, Father connected to a bigger picture, a picture of eternity, and not just here and now. I love you so very much. In your son's name we pray. Amen.